I came to bless him tonight, didn't you? Yeah. Father, we enter this place to praise you and bless your name because you're so worthy, Lord. Many people around the nation have come into your house, Lord, and all they come for is constantly just needs, Lord. But we come tonight to give something to you. We come to minister to you, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would turn your ear our way, Lord. God, that we could say something that would please you. And the only reason we ask such a great question, Lord, is because we believe what John 4 says, that the kind of worshipers you are seeking tonight are those that will worship you in spirit and in truth. We've come here tonight to worship you, Lord, with all of our heart, our soul, and our might, Lord. Everything we have, Lord, we bless you. Everybody say this with me. I will bless the Lord. At all times. all times. He's good. He's good. He's good. Oh, come on. He's good. Yeah. Now, forget about what's going on up here. And let's bless the Lord, okay? How many of you visited for the first time? This is your first time to browse. Well, hold your hand up. Look around real good and just forget about everybody. Because we're here to bless the Lord, all right? All right, choir. Here we go. Sing it with me now. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's good.
Come on, give Jesus better praise than that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I praise you, Lord. You're worthy, worthy, worthy of all the glory. We bless you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. There is none like you, Jesus. Nobody worthy but you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I took back what he stole from me. You're worthy, 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 Lord, of glory and honor. Worthy, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We lift you up, Lord. <laughs> You're so good, Lord. And your faithfulness endures forever. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, I bless you, Lord. Worthy is your name, Lord. Oh, beautiful Savior, we praise you. We praise you, beautiful Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. You're good, Lord. You're good, Lord. Yes, you are, Lord. You're so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. I lift my voice to praise you, Lord. Why don't you just do that right now? Come on, lift your voice and praise him. Praise him. Hallelujah. Yes, we praise you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I praise you, Lord. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. Just sing about the blood tonight, come on.
tonight to worship for you. He didn't come to hear me. He's heard me all week. He came to hear you. So lift your voice and praise him. Come on.
church. Holy, sing it, holy. Holy is the Lord. attention on him right now and say
week long I've been singing this song. I heard Mike sing a little bit before I left. I didn't know the words very well, but I want him to come and sing it right now. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you Here I am to worship here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here
praise you. Come on, you lift up your voice and praise him. Lift up your voice and praise him. Your voice, come on. Your voice. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you love him? <laughs>
Amen. If you do me a favor and shake hands with one of your neighbors before you sit down, you can be seated. Amen. Good job, Praise the Lord. How many of you come expecting to receive from the Lord tonight? <laughs> Tell you what, how many, um, you, we may have already done this, if so, forgive me, but how many uh, first-time guests do we have tonight? Let me see your hands tonight. Praise the Lord. Awesome. It's, it's great to have you tonight. Tonight we're... We're so excited. Our own pastor is going to be preaching tonight in just a few moments. He's going to be preaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And at the end of the service, we're going to be praying for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, we're so hungry here at Brownsville. I was sharing with uh, BR Sam's staff today that as pastor was sharing Sunday morning about his hunger for the moving of the Spirit, once again, my heart just began to throb uh, with expectancy and excitement about uh, what God is about to do in this place. And I know many of you, your hearts were burning inside of you. How many of your hearts were just burning Sunday morning as pastors are sharing? And friend, when he starts crying, I'm just I'm messed up, friend. I lose it right there, you know. <laughs> but um, in just a minute, I may receive a few couple of testimonies. Some of you may be here today, and and as pastors been speaking about the gifts of the Spirit and the moving of the Spirit. Maybe the Lord's doing some working inside of you, and, and, and we'd love to hear what God's doing in, in, in your heart in reference to this revival or maybe this, this, this fresh hunger of God working in your hearts. And so I may have just a, a few testimonies tonight in just a few moments, but um, I just want to uh, say tonight I'm so excited that we're going to believe God for an outpouring of His Spirit the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost already with evidence of speaking in tongues? Is that wonderful or what, friend? <laughs> let, me, let me find out one other thing also. How many visiting ministers do I have here today, if, if, if tonight? If we have any visiting ministers, stand, if you will, all over the building. All of our visiting ministers all over the building. Praise the Lord. Wonderful. 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 It's great to have all of you here, and we pray the Lord will bless you and touch you in a powerful way. In fact, at the end of the service, we believe that there's going to be so many wanting to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Pastor May call on some of you ministers to help us along with the prayer team. I remember when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, it, it's, it's hilarious, friend, because um, I'm, I'm not athletic at all, okay? Just trust me on that one. And I was, born, I was raised in the Catholic Church. I, and I, was, uh, I, and I wasn't Catholic by name, friend. I, we're talking Catholic, okay? I, I went to catechism. I, ten, all 12 years of catechism, I was an altar boy for 10 years. And I knew all about God, but I didn't know God. And um, I remember I got saved just about 40 minutes from here at Holt Assembly of God Church, just a little bit church um, on, on Highway 90. And I remember the night I got saved, there was only 30 people there. And we had an evangelist that night, and the only reason I was going to that church is because I liked the girl, and the only way I could go out with this girl was to go to church with her. <laughs> and so on Sunday morning, I was an altar boy in the Catholic church, and on Sunday night, I was going to this Pentecostal Assembly of God church, and I was, you know, I was like a cat in a dog pound. I had no idea what was going on. And, but I liked this girl, you know, so I just kept going back, and even though it petrified me, and... I remember the night I got saved, the, there was an evangelist there, and I don't remember what he preached, I don't remember what he said, but all I know is that something was happening inside of my heart. And uh, he comes to the altar call, and, and like so many preachers, he lied, and uh, he, said, uh, he said, I won't embarrass you, you know, I thought, okay. And he said, if, if, if God is dealing with you, and I don't know exactly the terminology, but I knew that God was doing something, he said, raise your hand. So I raised my hand. He said, I see that hand, young man. I thought, of course you do. <laughs> There's only 30 of us here, you know. 
<laughs> and then, it, like I said, he lied to me. He said, now, if you really are serious tonight, come down. And I remember I was in the third pew, and it was five miles down to that altar, friend. And I, I can't explain it. You know, a lot of times people say, well, why do people shake? And why do people, you know, react to the Spirit the way they do? I can't explain it, but I can't explain how, at 16 years old, I got up out of a third pew of a little bitty Pentecostal church. I got up out of that pew, a sinner Catholic. Not that the Catholic religion's bad, but I, was, I didn't know God, friend. I got up out of that th third pew, and I walked down that long aisle to that altar. And I, I got down there, and I cried a bucket of tears. When I knelt down, I was a sinner. When I got up, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. I can't explain it. All I know is that it happened. And I was, you know, I was just a Catholic boy. I didn't know, you know, that you had to really struggle to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, and I think it was the next week, maybe it was just a couple of weeks, but it was just a week or two, um, that, uh, that I would come. And I remember I'd get saved every, every week, Pastor. I would come down there, I'd cry a bucket of tears every week. And, and I, just, I just wanted to be right with Jesus. And I had a hunger for the Word of God. And um, I remember it was just a week or two after that when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'll never forget it, friend, because, <laughs> because I astonished myself. I, back then, I, I thought I was real cool. I was, I was, I was the John, John Travolta look-alike, friend. I, 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 had the, I had the white suit, Pastor. <laughs> And the big tall heel shoes, you know, and, and the pink silk shirt, and the, you know, I, I was decked out, and I had a fro out to here. I mean, I, I had a fro, friend, and I was a sight to behold. And uh, my young people still tick pit up, you know, they, they tease me, they call me Disco Crisco. But anyway, I, <laughs> I remember. I remember, I remember coming down to the altar that night to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I was a Catholic boy. I had no idea that you were supposed to struggle with this thing. I just had faith to receive it, you know. I'd received Christ just a couple of weeks earlier, and, and we, they were preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I come down, and uh, I, I remember asking the Holy Spirit to, uh, you know, to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I, I said, Lord, I give you everything I have, and I want everything you got. And I remember he, I, I got filled with the Holy Spirit, started speaking in tongues. Now, friend, I can't do this. Don't even ask me to do this. But this is honest, goodness, truth. I was standing there, and I did a backwards flip and landed on my feet, friend. Jesus filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I've never been the same again. Never been the same again. <clears throat> And you may be here tonight, and I'm sure there's several here tonight that, you know, there's a hunger in your heart, or maybe there's a, <laughs> I don't know if I want that stuff. Let me tell you something that's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. I don't know what I would ever do if I did not have the infilling of the Holy Spirit in my life to just to guide me and direct me. And so I'm excited about what God is going to do in this place tonight. And uh, I just want to build your faith tonight as we just... Uh, prepare to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and whatever else God wants to do in this place. But before I uh, give the microphone over to Pastor, I'd like to find out maybe if there's a couple of testimonies in the house of something has done, God has done something powerful in your life in this revival, or, or as Pastor's been preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, maybe God's stirring something really fresh inside of your heart, and you would, you, it would be a blessing to this congregation, you would like to share that. Uh, I'll take a couple of testimonies maybe very quickly. If, if that's you, if you've got a powerful testimony of what God's been doing in your life, if you'll raise your hand. Right back here. Come on up, sis. Right, real quick, all, uh, real high, up in the balcony of anybody. Just a, get something powerful that God's been doing in your life. Brother up in the balcony, come on up here. Come on up here, brother. Amen. One more right here. That'd be good. Um, <clears throat> we just want to build your faith. You know, I don't know about you, but I love to hear testimonies of what God's done in other people's lives. And uh, this is an awesome time of us being able to build each other's faith. Because the devil will try to tear your faith down, but as we begin to speak about what God is doing in our life, um, it, builds not, it builds the faith as we glorify the Lord together. So uh, share your name and then share with us very quickly what the Lord has been doing inside of you. Hi, I'm Susan Hager. I'm from Salem, Oregon. I'm a graduate of BR Sam, and I just got back off the airplane in the airport tonight from Oregon and seeing wow. family and everything. And I want to tell you the Holy Spirit's real in Oregon. He's real in Denver and San Francisco oh. and everywhere you go. And it is the best thing that will happen to you if any of you are just kind of lagging behind, like, I don't know if I want that or not. Trust me, I was a Nazarene and everything else and just conservative to the core until four years ago. It'll transform your life. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. And everybody around you is going to love you more. It's good. <laughs> Get in on it. Yes. Yes. 
Hi, my name is Mark Bishop. I'm from Des Moines, Iowa, and this exact same story. <laughs> Catholic all the way, all, all years of my life, met my wife. The only reason I went to church with her is because <laughs> I wanted to go out with her. Same thing, um, <laughs> exact same thing. But the, what the funny thing about it was is, is back in my other life, I used to be an extremely nasty person, you know, anyway. And when I was going through drug treatment, God put me in with a man that the day I went to church with my wife for the first day, he was standing in that foyer with his Bible. And it was five years later after I went to drug treatment. Anyway, I started coming here two weeks after revival started. I've been down here 10 times and for, for ever since the revival started, I come running home, Angie, Angie, my wife's there. God says we gotta sell everything, go to revival, I'm going to Bible school. And she goes, I'm from Des Moines now. She goes, go talk to Pastor Palmer. So I go to Pastor Palmer, I gotta sell everything. I'm gonna get in the ministry. Settles me down. Go, two months later, I come down here, Angie, Angie, we've been down, we gotta sell everything, God says sell everything. So we've been doing this for a long time. So all of a sudden, God has blessed us. So I mean, I, my, people tell me I have to keep, I have to write a book. But anyway, God has blessed us so much. No reason at all. My God has blessed my business. I've been in business for 20 years. He's just absolutely just gone us through everything. October, she goes, let's go to Pensacola. Wow. And I'm like, why? And she goes, it's time to sell everything and follow God. And I'm like, yes. And I'm enrolled in school. I start, I start here. I start school. I've been doing children's ministries for eight, nine years now. And God said, sell it. We sold everything. We sold everything we got. We packed up. I gave away a 20-year-old business that I've had. Just wiped it out. I'm down here. I'm making one-tenth of what I made up there. And I am more happy down here than I was up there. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. And real quick, I'm going to... Like I say, we're just like each other, brother. <laughs> Joyce Myers, go down. She says, you want to you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Go for it. And I'm down there, and I'm praying, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. And this woman walked up to me, and people say, I don't remember. They said, you went two feet up, seven feet back, <laughs> fell flat on my back, and I was out for two hours just, <laughs> and I don't remember nothing. But I know when I got up, man, it's totally different. Praise God for it. Amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jim Coons. I'm from Louisiana, Missouri, and I was also born and raised Catholic. <laughs> Catholic man. Hey, but uh, I, I was ministering in a church up in Pleasant Hill, Missouri, and they wasn't receiving the healing message. So I said, God, you're going to have to let me get sick to show these people you heal. Don't ever say that. Three weeks later, I thought I had the flu. I, I was driving a school bus and I was going past my stops. I was stopping before and I was really messed up. I went to the doctor and because I thought I had the flu. And he said, Call your wife, you're going straight to the emergency room. I had a glucose count of 953, and I drove the bus that morning. And I don't even remember checking in the hospital. But while I was there, the mayor of the town come in, and everyone that come in said, boy, there's, there's something in this room. And I said, that's my guardian angel. And I got out of the hospital, and they had me on insulin 30 units in the morning, 30 in the afternoon. And then I just told God, I know I'm healed. Then one morning, I was in the bathroom, and my wife come in there, and I was just praising the Lord. Praise left my hand, and she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praising God. And he gave me a scripture. And that scripture is Psalms 107, verse 20. It, is, it says, I sent my word and healed you and delivered you from your destruction. So I quit taking my insulin immediately. Quit taking it. 30 units in the morning, 30 at night. I went to the doctor. And he said, what are you doing? What are you doing here? I said, I quit taking my medicine. He said, you did what? He didn't say those words, but 
you know. He said, you get in that room and I'll be in there in a minute. We'll, we'll see what's really happened. So he, he took my blood, went in there and put it on the machine. And he come in here in the room and said, what'd you say happened to you? Wow. I said, God healed me. Praise God. And he said, I don't believe it. And he cussed. He did all kinds of things. He said, give me some more blood. I'm going to send it to Kansas City. And you come back Monday morning, and I'll have the answer for you. So Monday morning, I was in his office. He come in the room. He said, what would you say happened to you? <laughs> and I said, God healed me. <laughs> And two weeks later, I got a letter from him said, I don't want to see you anymore <laughs> because you could get this and die on the spot. He says, you just go find you another doctor. But praise God, he healed me. Praise God. Amen. Give the Lord praise tonight. I'm the niece bumpers. Um, I was introduced to Brownsville in um, 1999 through Waterfront Rescue Mission for Women, um, which where I was staying. And um, when I first came here, it was a trip. <laughs> it was a trip. I didn't like it. I didn't know why I was here. I didn't understand the music. I wasn't used to all that. It was strange. It was new. And um, when I first came, I had joined another church which uh, I've been in and out of church all of my life, and um, but I always try to get undercover in a church. And I joined a church, predominantly black church, and uh, after I'd been in Waterfront Rescue Mission, I stayed there a year. And as I continued to come to Brownsville, I felt, when I found out that they had Sunday school, <laughs> it blew my mind. <laughs> And I was like, found out it was so many different Sunday schools. I had never had that type of experience. And so I was, I, I was gung-ho. You know, I really wanted to be here if, for nothing else but Sunday school. And when I began to come to Sunday school, the Lord began to draw me. And um, I struggled with that because I thought that I was all right where I was or where I had planned on being. And um, I joined that church, and I asked the Lord, I said, well, Lord, uh, you know, what's going on? Why do I feel... I'm led to be here, you know, these ain't my kind of folks, and they don't sing my kind of music, and, you know, everything is different up in here, you know. And um, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said that I was here because I was breaking tradition. I was breaking tradition. And so I've been here, uh, I think I've been here two years. I still struggle sometimes. Um, my desire is to be in the school of ministry, and um, I don't have my GED, so I struggle with that. Uh, but my desire is to be in the school of ministry. My desire is also to be a daughter in the house pastor. Um, and to be a part of the ministry here. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to encourage you to just open up yourself to the Lord. You go, well, I may not understand it. Listen, there's a lot of things in life I don't understand. I don't understand how an airplane works. You know, I know there's aerodynamics and all that. I don't understand how it works, but that doesn't, is not going to prevent me from getting on it. I don't understand how a car works, but that isn't going to prevent me from driving one. And listen, you may not be able to understand because his ways are above your ways and his thoughts are above your, your thoughts. But just open up and let the Lord minister to you tonight. Amen? Praise the Lord. Make my pastor welcome tonight as he comes. Just to stand again, please. I want to see you. All the ministers. Some of you didn't stand a while ago. 
Hallelujah. Those that's in the ministry full-time, I want you to come forward. Those of you that's in the ministry full-time, I want you to come forward here for just a moment. I'm going to have the congregation pray for you. I'm going to lay my hands on you and pray for you. Before we go any further, there's a good group of ministers here with us tonight. We're not going to take a long time doing this, but this is something that the Lord laid on my heart to do, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask everybody to stand, please. Those that's in the ministry full-time, you're a full-time minister? Hallelujah. You guys, four guys, come here just a minute. Come here just a minute. Where y'all from? Come on up. I need my mic. You're from Brazil? Come on up, guys. Just stand up here with me for a minute. Hi. God bless you. Good to have you. Hi. Good to see you. Do any of you speak English? You speak English? What are you doing here from Brazil? Um, I'm work with, uh, I have a little church with the Portuguese language in Jacksonville. Jacksonville. And so who are these brothers? This is Pastor Antonio. He's from, uh, pastor of the church in Guarapuava in Brazil. Okay. He's visit, and he came to visit his son, Pastor Saulo, that has a Portuguese church in Atlanta, and he decided to come to visit Brownsville. So he came from uh, Brazil to visit his son and come to Brownsville. And who is this guy here? And he's the pastor that lives in Destin, and he has a little church to, with a Portuguese language. Yeah. When I saw you up in the balcony, <clears throat> God's got something wonderful for you, my friend. Where do you pastor? Yes. In Atlanta? In Atlanta. The Lord's going to do something mighty powerful for you. I can see it. I can see it. Hallelujah. Join them down here if you will. Just join them right down here. I want Brownsville for the, just the next few moments. I'm going to ask about 50 people from the audience that's on fire for God, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you got the victory, I'm going to ask you to come, about 50 of you, and we're just going to go through here right quick and we're going to pray for these ministers. I want to make sure they get prayer tonight, because the service as we go along is going to be different. We're going to be praying for people at the end of the service to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I don't want these ministers to leave out of here without us laying our hands on them. God's going to do something powerful here tonight. I'm telling you, He's going to do something powerful. This brother here, Something powerful is going to happen in his life, I can tell you. Might not be tonight, but when he leaves here and goes back to Atlanta, something's going to happen. Watch what I tell you. Remember what I'm telling you. I want everybody just to just sort of take a few minutes here and just extend your hands this way, and we're going to go through as quickly as possible and pray for him. <sighs> Hallelujah. Shabbat <laughs> Hallelujah. These are the days of Elijah. Power anointing. Power anointing. Power anointing. Lord, come in your mouth and in your tongue like a fire. Righteousness. <laughs> hallelujah. These are days of Oh, hallelujah. Sometimes my plant gets too much water, turns out and drops its leaves. Sometimes God has to put you in different soil. Everything clears up. You get waterlogged. People need what you got. Hear me? People need what you got. Don't turn the yellow. And start coughing your leaves. Yeah! Sure. Holy Ghost. In the mighty name of Jesus, 
Before we're seated tonight, I want you to pray for one another because God's going to do some powerful things in this house tonight. Do that right now. Find your prayer partner. Let's pray one for another. Come on. Whew. Anointing. Anointing of the Holy Ghost. Come on.
Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. You cannot afflict God's people. There's healing in the house because Jesus is in the house. Somebody said before I came in here tonight, I was so tired and wore out. But the Bible says there's victory and there's liberty in the Holy Ghost. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Man, man, man. Right now, I declare this house a no Satan zone. No Satan. No demons. There's victory in the house. Say it with me, onward and upward. I'm not going back. I'm going forward. There's nothing you can do about it, devil. Whew. Take that, devil. Amen. Amen. New beginnings. Woo. New beginnings. New beginnings. New fields. New harvest fields. New faces. New people. New cars. New geography. My feet ain't never been there before, but they're going to be. Hallelujah. God's got something so powerful for some of you, you don't even know what he's got. Hallelujah. You say, I'm worn out, Pastor. Good. His strength is made perfect in worn out people. <laughs> Woo, don't get me started. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be here tonight. 
Mark my word. The Lord's going to fill some of you tonight with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some of you sought it a long time. Some of you's wanted it a long time, and you've never received it. But you're going to receive it tonight. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for you. We're going to lay hands on you. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. Some of you have a wrong concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I pray that the Lord will just uproot that tonight and cast it away and give you a brand new concept of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost is the most wonderful thing that could ever happen to a Christian. It will change your life. It will rock your world. Amen. Right now, though, we're going to receive the offering. And I'm going to read the title. Well, go ahead. It's all right. I'm going to read the tither's blessing over everyone that gives tonight in the offering. I want you to prepare your offering. We're going to give it to the Lord. If you need a financial breakthrough, get ready. Is John Michael in here? He stepped out. <clears throat> Let me talk to you for a moment before you make out your offering. Every week at Brownsville, for those of you, how many of you are not part of Brownsville Assembly? Can I see your hand, please? Every week at Brownsville, I read the tither's blessing over the congregation. And from the time I started reading this blessing, it is amazing what began to happen. All down through the years, I've never received the tithes and offerings in any church I've ever pastored, including Brownsville, until about a year ago. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, just as you have blessed the congregation, just as you have blessed children at dedications, just as you have blessed churches, and as you have spoken blessings over different uh, stratas of church life, the Lord said, I want you to write out a blessing for the givers, for the tithers, and for the offerings. And he said, I want you to begin to have the, the people at Brownsville stand up <clears throat> and hold their offering up and hold their right hand forward and you make a proclamation over the congregation and over the givers. And I began doing that about a year ago. There's been times that I've come in the church across the street and we just have been here about a month now, but there's been times that I've come in the church across the street and when people lifted up their hands on Sunday morning and held up their tithes and offerings, <clears throat> there's such a spirit <clears throat> would come in the sanctuary that I found it hard and difficult. Sometime I really had to struggle to even stand up behind the pulpit. When those people lifted up their hands, it was time for me to speak that blessing many times. I couldn't even hardly get the blessing out. A power would come in that place and just begin to whip around like a wind. It's awesome. And then the testimonies begin to come. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about little ditty testimonies, you know, I'm talking about substantial, sustained testimonies. And I begin to encourage the congregation to tithe, <clears throat> and I begin to really educate, and I'm still in the process of that every Sunday morning, I begin to educate the congregation about giving, about tithes and offerings. And as I have done that, it has been absolutely remarkable to see what God has done in this congregation at Brownsville Assembly of God. So tonight, I'm going to speak this blessing, and as I release it, I don't want you to doubt, and I don't want you to be cynical, and I don't want you to think, well, this is just another ploy to get money. Because before God, it's not. It really isn't. It's the time in the service to receive the offering. And we do this in each service. <clears throat> and friend, if you give in the offering, God bless you. If you don't give in the offering, you're still welcome. I'll never know whether you give or not. It doesn't make me any difference. It doesn't make me any difference. But if you won't be cynical and you'll release 
your offering tonight in this offering, and you'll release it by faith and put your faith in what I'm going to proclaim, you'll be amazed what will happen. You'll be amazed. So if you're going to give in the offering tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to hold your tie, or your, not your tithes, but your offering up. Your tithes belongs in your church where you're fed. <clears throat> but I'm going to ask you to hold your offering up, and I'm going to speak and proclaim this blessing. And when I do, I want you to just let, just sort of reach out. If you have your offering, somebody have their offering. Bring your offering, sweetheart. Come up here with me just a minute. Whenever, just hold your offering up like you're going to out there in the audience. What's your name? Amanda. Amanda. Hey, babe. I thought I recognized you. When you hold your offering up and I begin to speak this blessing right here, all this is, you can write your own blessing. There's no magic in this, none at all. But when I speak the blessing, when I release these words by faith, it's just like something attaches onto that. It really is. Just like something grabs onto it, attaches onto it. When you plant it, it is just exactly like a seed going into ground. I can't explain it, but it is. That feels really full. <laughs> Hold it up. God's holy word declares that if you'll bring the tithe into the storehouse, he will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There shall not be room enough to receive it. God also boldly declares that he will rebuke the devourer so he cannot and will not destroy the fruits of your labor. Therefore, I proclaim financial incredible Woo! I proclaim incredible financial increase upon you and your house. I call in jobs for those of you who are unemployed. I call in better jobs for those of you who desire and need them. I bless you for a breakthrough where what's been clogged up and restricted will begin to flow normally again. And because of your obedience in God's tithe and offerings, I declare God's favor to be upon you so that those things that you have been, that has been tied up in the courts, such as your inheritance, godly settlements, and estates be released so you may begin to enjoy what God meant to be rightfully yours all along. And God has stated that he wishes you to prosper. So therefore, I speak a blessing to come upon those of you who work in sales and commissions that deals and opportunities be attracted to you like metal to a magnet. Hallelujah, that's not in there, but I felt it. And that God prosper you in an extraordinary way. I speak over this giving congregation that opportunities for advancement will come to you. And I also call forth raises and bonuses as you need them. I call back to your residences and your wallets and your bank accounts what the devil has attempted to steal from you. And as with Job in the Bible, I speak that God restored double what's been lost or stolen. And because the Lord rejoices over his children and he delights to see us happy and blessed, I speak that the Lord will cause you to find money. You would not believe this week the emails and the letters that I've gotten from people that has found money right out of the clear blue. You say, oh, I don't believe that. Well, you won't find none. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that God can let you find money right out of the clear blue? Get ready. Don't you come bringing no lottery money in here. And God will bless you and surprise you with unexpected checks in the mail. Right out of nowhere. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, that never happens to me. Well, you've been repelling it. Start believing it, and all of a sudden you'll say, Whew, what in the world is going on? For those of you that God has blessed as entrepreneurs, may your mind be inspired with God ideas and God inventions so that you can prosper. And for those of you that own your own businesses, I speak that God begin to bless your business so you can bless your employees with good pay and package benefits. I speak a spirit of abundance upon this con congregation that God miraculously, and I say miraculously, bring you out of debt. Yeah. 
so that the stress of death and the burden of death will release your minds and that you will come into a new peace and a new reality of financial freedom like you've never experienced in your life. May you and your house begin to enjoy plenty so you may give liberally and generously in offerings as well as alms to the poor. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Now come and bring your offerings into the storehouse. Hallelujah. And for the reading of God's word, the ushers are coming to receive the tithe of the offerings. And I want to speak tonight on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't hear a lot today preached about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You hear it mentioned, but you don't hear a lot preached about it. You probably might not hear anything that's new, but you will certainly hear some things you need to be reminded of. Amen? Amen. Tonight, I want to entitle this message, for those of you that are going to get a tape, Five Benefits of the Baptism. Five Benefits of the Baptism and the Holy Ghost. And I will take most of my time on number five. The first four, I'll give them to you as quickly as possible. There's going to be <clears throat> a lot of scripture reading tonight. I just can't really preach too good without reading a lot of Bible. That's just the way I am. I can't help it. I don't apologize for it, but I like to give the word to give confirmation to what I'm saying. Amen? <clears throat> so I don't think anything preaches as good as the word of God anyway. So I'm preaching on five benefits of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Those of you that are listening by radio, if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you're a Christian, I want you to listen because I believe you'll hear some things that will help you and possibly even open your eyes and help you to understand why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Those of you listening by the Internet and also those of you that will be getting a tape of this service, uh, I believe that God is going to speak to your heart about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For those of you that do have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's been a long time since you have used your prayer language, you probably need a fresh infilling and a fresh baptism in the Holy Spirit. This hour that we're living in requires that we must move in the realm of the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. Man, there's stuff out there today like I have never seen and it seems to be intensifying. I believe the Lord's about to come. <laughs> Acts chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. You may be seated. <clears throat> Today, there's a lot of churches and a lot of ministries that refuse to preach tongues, that refuse to preach the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now why, I don't know. Because it is biblical, it is scriptural. The days of miracles, the days of people receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit has not passed away. It is still relevant and apropos for today just like it was 2,000 years ago. 
How many of you understand we're still living in the church age? And I believe that the church of today needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost as bad or maybe even worse than the early church did. They had a lot of violence they had to deal with back then. They had a lot of uh, demon possession they had to deal with and all kind of things like that. You read it in the book of Acts. But today, there's so much. There's drugs. There's pornography. There's alcoholism. There's demonism. There's all kinds of false doctrines being vomited up out of hell. And it's covering our land like a thick fog, a demonic fog. And I believe that churches that continue to resist the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit, I believe they'll have to give an account to an almighty God one day before too long. Many people today are ashamed of the things that accompany the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As I said before, many churches like to pick and choose what they will receive and what they're comfortable with in regard to the Holy Spirit. They'll say, I'll take the comfort. I'll take the, um, the fruits of the Spirit. And I'll take the um, presence of the Lord. I'll take the chill bumps. I'll take the, the tears running down my face. I'll take that, but I don't want the tongues. I don't want no demon-possessed people being dealt with in church. I got a question. If somebody's demon-possessed and they're not dealt with in church, somebody tell me where will they be dealt with? Where will they be dealt with? Answer me, help me. Where will they be dealt with? Somebody's going to pump them full of Prozac. Somebody's going to put them on a psychiatrist's couch. Somebody's going to put them in a mental institution. If a person is demon-possessed, and I don't know why the American church has a problem believing that people can't be demon-possessed, and if somebody is demon-possessed, they all live in Haiti. <laughs> I'm here to tell you there's some in Pensacola, and there's some all over the United States. If somebody is filled with a demonic power, where else are they going to get help if not in the house of God? And if the house of God and we ministers don't make time to deal with people that's tormented by demonic spirits, I believe God will hold us in judgment one day. You say, but oh, Brother Kilpatrick, that's too controversial. Everything is controversial. Everything is. Worship is controversial. Preaching is controversial. Preaching on the blood is controversial. Healing is controversial. Tongues is controversial. Tell me what's not controversial. But I refuse to be one of those pastors that's going to be a seeker-friendly church, make people feel comfortable about everything. When they come in, nothing's going to make them feel uncomfortable. I refuse to be one of those kind of churches. Because sometimes people don't need to feel, hear things that makes them feel comfortable. They need to hear things that will help them. Are you listening to me? I'm not after doctors. I'm not after lawyers. I'm not after money people. I'm not after the poor. I'm just after people. People need the Lord. And people need the Lord in different degrees. And I believe no matter what church they attend, they ought to be able to find help and there ought to be enough power in that church to deliver that person and to set them free and help them become the person they want to become. And it's not a 10-step program. AA won't do it, friend. And a seminar won't do it, and counseling won't do it. It's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost. I tell you, one of the things that is needed today in churches across America and around the world is for God's people to have a power encounter with the Lord. That's the only thing that's going to change people. When you have a power encounter, I promise you, you'll never be the same. I was saved a long time before I ever had a power encounter with God. I was saved a long time. I loved Him. I felt Him. I enjoyed Him. But when I had a power encounter with God, it forever changed my life. I'll never, ever forget some of those times. And they've been interspersed all throughout my Christian walk with God. My father left us when I was real young, and I 
I was brought up and sired up, mentored in the ministry under my pastor, Reverend R.C. Wetzel. His brother-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law, is his son. My sister, my oldest sister, Shirley, married first, and she married my brother-in-law, Paul. That was my pastor's son. And because he was a family member, it gave me access to my pastor. And he knew the, the hell that I came out of, out of in my family. And so his children was already raised, and he was a powerful man of God, a prayer warrior. And he invited me. He, he made the invitation. He invited me to just live with him, basically. I still slept at home at night, but that's all. I just slept at home. But I was with him all the time. And I, I, wouldn't, give, I wouldn't give anything for those times that I had with him. And he engendered in me a love for the power of God and for the Holy Spirit that I probably would have never had any other way. But I got to reap the years of his life in the ministry. I got to reap as a boy. I was just a boy. God called me at 14, and, and right after God called me, he came to my mother. He said, Ira May, can I have your son? and train him up in the ministry. And my mama, with tears running down her face, said, Brother Wetzel, would you do that for my boy? And he said, I'd be happy to. And I was with him seven days a week, all the time. He was just like my father, but he was my mentor. And man, what a mentor he was. Most graceful man you've ever met. He was graceful. He was powerful. He had a powerful, booming, anointed voice but his face was flooded with mercy. He always had such grace in his face and compassion. I never saw him look at me in a way that I, I hated for him to look at me. He never looked at me like that. He always looked at me with such admiration and love and respect. I don't ever remember him uh, ever damaging me in any way with a temper tantrum, a fit, uh, vengeance of any kind. He was the most graceful man you could ever imagine. And he took me into prayer meetings with him, night after night. I was with him for years, many years. And long after I left and, and married Brenda, uh, we had our first son, Scott. He was nine months old when I got in the ministry. And after I got in the ministry and took my first church, Scott was nine months old when I took my first church in Georgia, and many nights, I would drive three hours from Vidalia, Georgia to Columbus to be in prayer meetings with Brother Wetzel. And then after the prayer meeting was over, one, two, or three o'clock in the morning, I'd drive three hours home and go to work the next day. That's how vital those prayer meetings was in my life. I saw things in those prayer meetings that was indisputable and undeniable. And I used to lay there and wonder I lay there in the dark as I told the church last Sunday. I'd lay at my pastor's feet in the dark and I'd hear those stories over and over and over. Never got tired of them. He would prep us. He would talk to us about every conceivable thing you can imagine. But he would always, with a broken voice, tell us, you have to rely on the Holy Ghost. I could have never got that in Bible school. Never. You can't buy that with money. I can still hear his voice as I'm preaching with a broken, tender, raspy voice saying, Son, you've got to always rely on the Holy Ghost. You don't need to be seen. You don't need to be heard. But you need to rely on the Holy Ghost. He can do more, he said, in 15 seconds than you can do in a lifetime of ministry. And you know what? I live to see the day that that was true. If I don't get on my sermon, I won't preach. <laughs> he was a man that walked with God. I tell you, he knew God. The man knew God, friend. I can't explain it. I don't know what it was about him. He, he just had a confidence about him, and he had a presence about him. When you was around him, you knew you was around a man of God. I was so shocked when I left and went out in the ministry and got out from under his covering and I had to get out and make my own way. 
In other words, I was thrust out of the nest, and I had to get out away from him. And I moved out on my own in, in my own church. I'll never forget how shocked I was that all men of God wasn't like him. More of them was interested in their golf scores than there was about how many people were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit last Sunday. More of them was interested in uh, sports, and the Atlanta Braves and the Boston Red Sox, White Sox, whatever they are, some kind of socks. <laughs> and they was more interested in that. And I, I, I just, when I got out there and, and I got out from under him and I began to be around other ministers, I couldn't believe how secularized they were. And boy, I wanted to just race back to the darkness of that church and lay on that carpet at his feet and hear those stories again. Wow. Here's what the question was asked in Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul said in verse 3, in verse 2, he said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, well, we haven't even as much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And look at the question. He said, well, what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. And then Paul used that. And he said, well, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. And he said to the people that they should believe on him, that is Jesus, who would come after John, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and then Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them now somebody says what would the baptism of the Holy Ghost do for me brother Kilpatrick I love God I'm saved if I died I'd go to heaven but what would the baptism of the Holy Ghost do for me I will say this, it will do for you what it did for those in the book of Acts. There's five things that I want to cover tonight that the baptism of the Holy Spirit will do for you. If you're cheap and you want to make notes and you don't want to buy a tape, <laughs> I'm going to give you these five points, but if I see you taking notes, I know you're cheap and I know that you don't want to buy a tape. So go ahead if you want to I'll give them to you but I'm not gonna give them to you real slow <laughs> no, I'm kidding number one the baptism of the Holy Ghost will give you an abiding evidence of your acceptance with God one of the greatest torments that a Christian can experience is the torment of doubt I am surprised at the Christians that really wonder are they really going to heaven I'm surprised at the Christians that really have true doubt. They wonder, if something happened to me, if I had cancer, if I was laying on my deathbed, would I really go to heaven? And the devil torments them with that doubt all the time. Doubt is a horrible thing. It stings. It hurts. It cuts. It's a sadistic thing, and the devil loves to use doubt on Christians. It has the power to change your mind under duress. Whenever you're under duress and doubt assails your mind, it has the power to change you from an unintimidated, powerful, witness for God to a groveling, defeated, weak, powerless voice. It's what doubt can do for you. The devil will make you doubt that you're saved. The devil will make you doubt that you're healed. The devil will make you doubt that the Word of God is the Word of God. The devil will make you doubt that God will do for you what he's done for other people. All kinds of doubts I could deal with tonight, and I'm not going to take much time with it. I remember one time, right here in Pensacola, uh, back in the early 80s, I hadn't been at Brownsville long, 
but I had been here long enough to pastor one of the sweetest little Christian women you've ever met. And she was a little old Christian woman, had one of these little lace handkerchiefs she always carried, you know, and had a little Bible and everything was prim and proper. And her little hair was dyed blue, you know. And, uh, and she just was one of those little sweet Christian ladies. Precious. And every time you'd see her, she just looked like the epitome of a Christian Pentecostal witness. That's just who she was. I've seen thousands of them in my life in the ministry, pastored a bunch of them, and she was just one of those, if you would think of a, just a perfect specimen of a Pentecostal Christian granny, she was it. But she took cancer, and she started dying. And I went to visit her several times at home, and I prayed with her. I loved on her, you know, and just told her how valuable she was to the church and how we all missed her and how we all loved her. You know, and, and, and every time I prayed with her, she'd always grip my hand and she'd say, Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, please pray. And so I thought she was afraid of the cancer. But the last time I saw her, I went in there and prayed with her. She was gaunt. She said to her family, she said, set me up in the bed and I want y'all to leave the room. And they set her up in the bed and she's a little frail thing right at death's door, man. I mean, just frail. And she said, Brother Kilpatrick, my voice is weak. Would you pull your chair up here close where I can talk to you? And I pulled my chair up close. And she said, I've got to come out with it before I die. I said, come out with what? She said, Brother Kilpatrick, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I said, what? She said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I said, no, how did you come to that conclusion? I just talked real bold to her. Because I knew that whatever was in her mind had not just come there, it had been there a long time. So I knew if I was going to help her, I had to sort of bark at her a little bit. And so she said, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. And I said, now why do you say that? She said, well, a long time ago, and she told me the story. And she told me that she had been involved with a man years ago, and she was married, but she got involved with another man. And she said it wasn't but a time or two, and it was over. And she said, I asked the man to please forgive me, and I asked my husband to please forgive me. But she said, Brother Kilpatrick, I'm dying now. And she said, I believe that thing's going to send me to hell. I said, have you ever asked the Lord to forgive you? She said, thousands of times. I said, you didn't need to ask him at one time. She said, sure enough. <laughs> and I said, sweetheart, I said, let's put this thing to bed once and for all. I said, let me lay my hands on you and I said I'm gonna drive that doubt back and I said God's gonna flood your little heart with peace brother Kilpatrick would you do that I said I'm gonna do it right now and I came over there to her bed and I just sort of leaned over the bed leaned my body over her little frail body I put my hands up on her face and I said just tell Jesus right now what you did and she said Jesus I am so ashamed it was only once or twice Lord and she said, you know all about it. And she said, I just ask you, Jesus, if you can find it in your heart of hearts, would you please forgive me? I said, look, how many times you prayed that? She said, oh, I don't know, hundreds of thousands. I said, let me pray for you. I laid my hand right over her face like that. You know? <laughs> Shut that up. Man, I mean, the Holy Ghost come on me, and I prayed over her. And I took authority and drove that doubt right off of her like a bulldog over in the corner. And I said, now shut your mouth. And I said, now, Holy Spirit, come and flood sister so-and-so with the peace of God. And man, she started laying in the bed shaking like this under the power of God. She started shaking. She said, whoo, I never felt nothing like that. 
I said, once you get that doubt off of you, it's amazing the things you'll feel. Can you say amen? amen? Friends, some of you have done things in your life and you have regretted it for so long. And you say, yeah, Brother Kilpatrick, that's true for people that's, that's sinners and they did things like that. God will forgive them. I've got news for you. I want you to listen to me. God forgives sinners of every sin they ever commit. But he also forgives Christians for every sin they commit. The Bible said if we have no sin, we are liars. And i got a question for you. Before you come to Jesus, if you committed hundreds of sins, which I'm sure you did, <laughs> I hear people millions, 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 Pastor. <laughs> if you committed hundreds of sins, which I'm sure you did, thousands of sins, tens of thousands of sins, maybe you didn't do them with your body, but you did them with your mind. You thought them with your thought life. You thought them with your brain. You thought them with your mind. And before you came to Christ, he forgave you of every sin, and he took them away. Amen? Doesn't it stand to reason that if God would forgive you as a sinner of thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or maybe millions of sins, after you become a Christian and you sin one time, he walks away and says, no, 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 I'm sorry. That's not the way it works. I'm a preacher of the gospel, and I have to ask the Lord regularly to forgive me. And you know what? That blood still washes me. Hallelujah. It keeps me. And one of the main jobs of the Holy Spirit, one of the main jobs and one of the main functions and one of the main purposes of the baptism in the Holy Ghost is that there is a spirit in you that cries, you're his. You're his. Turn to Romans. I want to, I want to read this to you. Romans chapter number 8. Glory. This is reaching home with some of you. I can feel it. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 15. The Bible said, You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Would you read that with me? Where it says, Ye say, Me, I say, I. For I have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but I have received the spirit of adoption, whereby I cry, Abba, Father. Now let me read verse 16 to you. It says, The Spirit itself. Who? Fear. Say it out loud. Fear. Say it like this. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. itself Fear. bears witness, Fear. witness Fear. with my spirit Fear. that I am a child of God. Fear. And if children, Fear. then heirs, Fear. heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we may also be glorified with him. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Woo! Hallelujah. The Bible said, the Spirit itself bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. One of the main functions of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is he takes that nagging doubt away. And he bears witness. Man, how would you like to have the Holy Ghost as a witness for you? The devil says, you're not a child of God. And the Holy Ghost says, your honor may honor the witness box. Yeah. Amen. And then the Holy Ghost begins to bear witness. Oh, man, Jesus died for him. Jesus died for her. Jesus spilled his blood for her. She's not perfect, but she's forgiven and she's going to heaven. Tell you, let me tell you something, friend. The devil is the worst prosecutor you've ever heard in any courtroom. He's vicious. He can take a good person and so prosecute you and make you feel like you'll never, ever measure up to the grace of God. But, oh, Jesus is such a faithful witness. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody help me tonight. I said Jesus is such a faithful witness. 
he steps up and he says they're washed in the blood and they're forgiven and they're bound for heaven whether they feel like it or not. I want to tell you something, friend. If you're a child of God and you repented of your sins and you may not be perfect, then there's none of us that's perfect. If you die, you haven't got but one place to go. You don't get out there in some kind of an ethereal world and heaven says, what do you think? Jesus says, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I never really did care much for him when he was living. <laughs> never really cared that much for him. I mean, he, you know, he was all right, but, I, you know, I can take him or leave him. <laughs> and then after you die, it's like you're somewhere out there in the ethereal world and the Holy Ghost. I mean, the devil's out there telling you that whenever you die, you're going to go to some kind of, um, what do they call it? Uh, purgatory. Oh, that's a good one. Purgatory. And depending on how much shekels you've got, how much tithes and offerings you rob God of that you left with now, maybe you can pay your way out of there. Amen? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. If you're a Christian and you have repented of your sins and you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you die, you haven't got but one place to go, and that's heaven. Amen? If you're a Christian and you love the Lord, you say, but does it matter what grade Christian I am? What caliber of Christian I am? Friend, I don't read anywhere in my Bible about different grades of Christians. You're either lost are you saved? And if you're saved, you're not perfect, but you're saved. So here's, here's my argument. If the Lord forgave you of millions of sins before you became a Christian, doesn't it make sense after you become a Christian, if you really flub the dub and really mess up, doesn't it make sense that if he, if he forgave you of millions, he'll say, I can take care of this too. And you're forgiven. One of the things that the Holy Ghost does, one of the functions of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is he bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God and the doubt passes away. Number two, another major function and benefit of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is he will stabilize you and he will build character in you and he will build integrity in you. Amen? How many of you remember Peter in the Bible? The Lord said, Satan has desired to sift you sweet, Simon. Right? But he said, I prayed for you. How many of you like to have Jesus praying for you? He said, but I prayed for you. And he said, I'm trusting that after you're converted, you're going to strengthen the brethren. Well, the Lord knew that Peter in that condition right then was weak, he was his son, he was a disciple, he was in the fold, but he was really flawed in a lot of ways. Peter was impetuous. Peter was a braggadocious type person. He liked to throw his chest out, he liked to venture out, he liked to be the center of attention. He was indiscreet about a lot of different things. But Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. But he knew he was weak. Matter of fact, he knew he was so weak that whenever that little maid came along and said, you're one of them, this mighty man just crumbled like a nervous child. He said, oh, but, but, uh, but, but, I, don't, I don't even know him. I'm not his disciple. No, no, not me. <laughs> we need to talk. Not me. I'm not his disciple. Little lady, you got the wrong person. Jesus saw all that coming. But I'll tell you what else Jesus saw coming. He saw that on the day of Pentecost, tongues of fire, like of, tongues like as of fire, was going to fall on the 120 in the upper room. And he knew that that man that couldn't even stand up to a maid was going to stand up under the anointing and preach on the day of Pentecost, and thousands would be saved. He took a week, week, somebody you couldn't count on when the chips were down. He said to Jesus, he said, though all these forsake you, I'll never forsake you. 
Jesus, see, that's how braggadocious Peter was. He was arrogant. And he said, they may not stand for you, Lord, but I'll stand for you. And that's when Jesus said, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. But Jesus didn't drop him off there and cut him off there. He knew that when the Holy Ghost came on Peter, he was going to be bold. Matter of fact, he was going to be so bold, he wouldn't just stand up to a little maid, but one day he was going to face death, and he was going to face it so calmly and so resolutely, he would say, if you're going to crucify me, please don't crucify me like you did Jesus. I'm not worthy to hang like he hung. Crucify me upside down. That's what the Holy Ghost did for him. Man, I feel that. And some of you saying, Brother Kilpatrick, I fall so many times. I slip so many times. You talk about integrity a lot. You talk about character a lot. But Brother Kilpatrick, I wish I had character. I wish I had integrity. I wish God could count on me when the chips are down. But Brother Kilpatrick, I don't, so many times I think I'm strong, but most of the time I'm so weak. Let me tell you something. What you need is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It will stabilize you. It will calm you. It will change your personality. It will take the weak things of your personality and the Holy Spirit will come on the inside of you and He'll shore up those weak areas. And He'll build a powerful man of God out of you. He'll build a powerful woman of God out of you. Number three, I don't have time to turn. I was going to read a whole chapter, but I've got to rush. Number three, the baptism of the Holy Ghost will bring satisfaction to you. Can you say amen? amen? Today, multitudes of Christians are miserable. Can I say that again? Today, multitudes of Christians are saved, but they're miserable. Absolutely miserable. They're in church, but they're miserable. They know instinctively they know there's got to be more there's got to be more reality than just signing a card joining a church shaking the preacher's hand there's got to be more and I'm here to tell you there is more <laughs> preachers know that their congregations are miserable Denominations know that their denominational ranks are dwindling because Christians realize there's got to be something more. And Christians are miserable. We are finally finding out that religion won't satisfy you. And church attendance won't satisfy you. We're also learning that things won't satisfy you. The stock market going to 11,000 and you making a ton of money won't satisfy you. A brand new motorcycle won't satisfy you. A brand new car won't satisfy you. A new home and land won't satisfy you. But there is a satisfying... <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what I say. There is a satisfying portion called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I want you to turn and read something with me. This is so good. Turn to John. I'm leaving out so many scriptures. John chapter 7. I can visualize Jesus doing this right here. It was a feast day. These were the Lord's feast, and Jesus was alive on the earth during one of the great feast days. And the Bible said in verse 37, Jesus stood up and he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Can you imagine that? It's like, well, Lord, what are you going to give us? Have you got a canteen up there? What have you got that we can drink if we're thirsty? Have you got a canteen? Is there a barrel up there? Is there some kind of sugar tent up there? What is it you've got that we can suck on and drink out of that's going to bring pleasure 
and satisfaction to us that you're offering us. What do you got? And look what he said. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Oh, friend, let me tell you something. When you're baptized with the Holy Ghost, it's not unusual to hear people testify later. It felt like something gushed and broke and broke loose on the inside of me and there was a river broke loose and I began to speak forth in an unknown tongue I'd never spoken before and oh my the peace and the joy and the power that flooded my soul but the word I'm talking about right now is satisfaction oh Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stone sings that song I can't get no Satisfaction. <laughs> well, have I got news for you, Mickey? Jesus satisfies. Hallelujah. I said, Jesus satisfies. He brings satisfaction when nothing else can bring satisfaction. Look at it one more time. In the book of John chapter 7, he said, He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He was talking about something that they could receive, but it hadn't been given yet. And he stood up on that great feast day and he said, are you thirsty? Are you unsatisfied? You know, one of the things that I have found about human beings is they're not so much dissatisfied. There's a difference between being dissatisfied and unsatisfied. You're not dissatisfied with your home. You're not dissatisfied with your husband. You're not dissatisfied with your wife. You're not dissatisfied with your church. You're not dissatisfied with your life or with your job, but you're just unsatisfied. It's like there's something about you that you just hadn't experienced yet. It's an unsatisfaction. And Jesus is saying, if you'll come to me, I can give you something that will satisfy you. Number four, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, number four, will move you beyond happiness into joy. Yeah. Happiness is an emotion. I looked this up today, and here's what it means. The word happen means luck. In Webster's Dictionary, modern dictionary, the word happen means luck, fortune, chance. It just so happened. They look at it like fortune, chance, luck. That's what the word happened. Look it up in your dictionary. That's what it means. So is it any wonder that happiness deriving from happenings, a lot of times you feel like just the lucky can be happy. Just people by chance can be happy. But me, I've never been happy. Let me tell you what a new car will do. A new car will make you happy. A new home will make you happy. A new wife or new husband, first marriage. <laughs> Let me take it easy here, glory to God. <laughs> will make you happy. A new puppy can make you happy. A new job can make you happy. A new thing can make you happy. But let me tell you, there's a big world and a universe of difference between happiness and joy. Because you see, joy is not predicated on things or people, but the Bible says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy 
and the Holy Ghost. And you know what? Today I took time, I pulled out my Strong's Concordance, and I just began to look through the Bible. You got time to turn with me real quick? Let's, let's take the book of Acts. I want to show you something real quick. <clears throat> you don't really find the word joy a lot until you get to the book of Acts. Did you know that? Acts is full of it. Let me tell you about joy. You see, happiness is derived from a certain happening. But joy, nothing can be happening at all. As a matter of fact, everything can be happening against you, and you can still have joy. Are you listening? Everything can be working against you. You can have just suffered loss. You're going to just suffered one of the greatest setbacks you've ever suffered, and you're laughing. And people says, poor thing. Poor thing. He's lost it. No, he found it. Amen? Can you say amen? He lost it. No, he found it. What did he find? The Lord, the Holy Spirit gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Matter of fact, I remember years ago, I, I met Christians, powerful Christians, old-time Pentecostal Christians, and I used to always want to fish their testimony out of them, how God saved them and how he filled them with the Holy Ghost and how he put this back together and how he did that. And I used to just sit and listen to people's testimonies by the hours. Back when I was a boy, we used to have cottage prayer meetings. And I used to go to those cottage prayer meetings with my mother, and I'd listen to people. And then at the cottage prayer meetings, I'd see people just be slain in the spirit of their homes, cottage prayer meetings, home meetings, and they would just break out laughing and just laugh uncontrollably. Somebody says, now that bothers me, Brother Kilpatrick, glory to God. The laughter bothers me, hallelujah. <laughs> Depression doesn't bother you, but laughter bothers you. <laughs> hallelujah, you own Prozac, that doesn't bother you, but now somebody, <laughs> oh, that troubles me so much. Isn't that crazy? Friend, I believe there's a time and a season for all things. I believe there's a time to laugh, there's a time to weep. I don't believe it's time to laugh when the preacher's preaching. I don't believe it's time to laugh during communion. I don't believe it's time to laugh during an altar call. But for heaven's sakes, let's laugh. And I had some of those old saints tell me, many of them would tell me, Brother Kilpatrick, I used to have to say to the Lord, now Lord, let up, because if you don't, I think I'll die. They used to tell me that. They used to say, I used to have to say to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sort of ease up a little bit, because I feel like if you don't, I'm on, I, I just can't take it, I'm going to die. And they'd just be laughing and breathless. Ecstasy was, glory to God. Just ecstasy, ecstasy. That's why Peter wrote in his book, and I'll read it to you in a minute, joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, the Bible said you shall laugh at calamity. You shall laugh when fear cometh. You'll laugh at it. If you do that today, the psychiatrists say, but God says, I have built you so that you're not like the world. The world sees the stock market going down. They cry. You can laugh and say, my hope is not in the stock market. My hope is in the Son of God. Somebody shout amen. My hope is not in George W. My hope is not in Hillary. My, my hope, hallelujah, my hope is not in Bill. And my hope is not in Jimmy. And my hope is not in Gerald Ford. And my hope is not in Ronald Reagan. My hope is in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody shout amen. Woo! Joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know what? My wife is so blessed. She has the greatest attitude. I'm old serious John, you know. But Brenda, she's got this penchant that she can laugh at anything. Y'all remember the night Steve Hills told about how they all got on that airplane, you know, and they was flying from Michigan. 
See, God gave me good sins. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory to God. And they all loaded up and got on the airplane, was flying from Grand Rapids home, and they got this horrible storm, and, 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 and the pilot was just beads of sweat all over me, lost control of the plane. The plane was diving, and they were, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And Brenda was, <laughs> And she said, Steve looked at her like, woman, what is wrong with you? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. The Bible says you'll laugh when calamity cometh. Somebody says, oh, Brother Kilpatrick, things are getting really bad. <laughs> Just like the Lord said. <laughs> you know, that's the way it ought to be. This getting, <laughs> this getting down and morbid over things. You know, the Lord at least gave us 2,000 years warning. <laughs> Amen. And it's like, ah, here it is. But you ought to be on top enough now and walking in the spirit enough now that you can say, glory, he's about to come. Hallelujah. I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Glory. Now, number five. Hallelujah. Number five, go to Ecclesiastes 4. We're having a good time, aren't we? I'm even blessing myself tonight, which is unusual. Glory to God. The other day I was going through the devil, and I cut the radio on, and Brother Glenter was playing one of my tapes on the Holy Ghost. Well, on the Holy Spirit, and I was driving along the road, and I, I thought, now, who is that guy? And I said, oh, that's me. Hello. <laughs> and I listened in, and I put my real critical ear on it. And the first year, as you know, I was driving along, and I blessed myself. I said, bless myself. You deserve a break today. Hallelujah. Just got blessed. I come home, I said, woman, did you hear that sermon on the radio? She said, no, I've been watching T.D. Jakes. I got blessed. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Please be asking. Chapter 4, glory. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I want you to look at this. This is a powerful scripture. Old Testament, of course. He said, Solomon said, I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. Behold the tears of such as were oppressed. They had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power, but they had no comforter. Now with that in mind, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 16 I want to show you the effects of the cross of Christ Mark chapter 16 Jesus said Mark chapter 16 verse 15 Hold your finger right there and go to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is Jesus speaking. It's a red letter edition. But you shall receive power. What did Ecclesiastes say? It said the power was on the side of the oppressor. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Power. You shall receive power. Say it. Power. You shall receive power. When? After the Holy Ghost 
is come upon you. Now I want you to look in, in, in Mark chapter 16. Hold your finger there. You already got it? And now I want you to turn to Luke 24 and verse 49. I want to show you something. You know, we all hear about the Great Commission. But the Great Commission comes in two parts. Look this way, everybody. The Great Commission comes in two parts. It's not heresy. It's not a false doctrine. It does. It comes in two parts. Let me read the Great Commission to you in Mark chapter 16. Look at it. Verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Now that's the Great Commission. Look in Luke 24 and verse 49. Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry, wait, you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands and blessed them, etc., etc. If someone were to say, what is the main purpose of the baptism in the Holy Ghost? And I've already listed five benefits of the baptism. But if someone were to say, what is the main benefit, the main purpose of the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you would have to admit like I would, it's for power. It's for power. And the Lord said, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead, etc., etc. great commission. You drink any deadly thing that won't harm you, great commission. But he said, now, whoa, 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 before you go, don't go anywhere. That's my commission to you. But go back to Jerusalem and wait until you get the power to do what I just commissioned you to do. Get the power. Now, let me explain something to you. I, don't take, I won't take time to read it to you. I could read it to you. It's in the Bible, but let's, let me explain it because I could save a lot of time. The Bible says that Jesus was the first man. Let me, let me show it to you. I'm going to have to do it. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 3. And I'm closing. I've been going an hour and five minutes. I'm closing. In just a few minutes. <clears throat> I'm closing. Jesus was the first man, the first person, the first human, although he was God, he was still human, to ever receive the Holy Ghost without measure. Before him, everybody else had received the Spirit of God, but in measure. It was meted out to him. For example, the Bible says that God took of the Spirit that was on Moses and took the spirit that was on him and divided it up and put it on the 70. Read it for yourself. God took the spirit that was on Moses and put it on the 70. The Bible says that Elijah had an anointing 
good for 15 miracles. God had measured out an anointing on Elijah's life to do 15 miracles. Elisha asked for a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah, and Elisha, read it in your Bible, did 30 miracles. God apportioned 15 miracles to Elijah, and he apportioned 30 miracles for Elisha. Elijah said it won't rain for three and a half years. Elijah, Elisha came along and said it won't rain for seven years, double. See that? Now, before the day of Pentecost, Gideon received a measure of the Holy Ghost, and he did powerful things. Gideon was a powerful man, and he did powerful things, but he only had a measure that God meted out to him to do and to function under that measure. But the Bible says about Jesus, look in John chapter 3, I want to read it to you. In John chapter 3, in verse 34, it says, For whom God is sent speaks the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. God did not give the Spirit by measure unto Jesus. So Jesus was the first one to receive the Spirit without measure. Bam, 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 bam. He was sinless. He never sinned, so he was saved. And God let the Spirit come on Jesus without measure. He just had carte blanche. When Christ died on Calvary and the veil of the temple was rent, the Holy of Holies was exposed, the Spirit came out and was now available to everyone. Male, female, red, yellow, brown, black, white, whoever. And God is making the Spirit available to us in the church age where we have the same spirit that Christ had. Amen. Calvary is remarkable. Calvary is awesome. Jesus didn't just die to give you a palace in heaven. Can you say amen? amen. He died so that he might conquer the enemy. He died that he might put the devil in his place. And God could give you an anointing. And God could give you power to do what he left off doing. He said, you shall do these and greater works than these shall you do because I'm going to my Father. His ministry was mainly in the Middle East. Many of you in this building have traveled all over the world. And God has done powerful things in your life. And I've got news for you. Said Jesus, Terry, the greatest days are yet to come. Because as, whoo, as wickedness does abound, his grace and his power does much more abound. So God has made available the Spirit of God to you. Remember what I read to you a while ago, and I'm closing. This is the last thing I'm going to say. The Bible said, Solomon said, in the days I have considered everything under the sun. And he said the power was on the side of the oppressor. And when Jesus came, the power was still on the side of the oppressor. But Jesus invaded that realm. And what he said was, I want you to look at me like Elisha looked at Elijah. I want you to see how I do things. I'm not bound by the oppressor. I have power over the oppressor. And I, oh, he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Somebody shout amen. amen. All power is given unto me. And he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I don't know about you, but I hate to see people mistreated. I hate to see people mistreated. I hate to see something happen to somebody and get beat up and get kicked around and get beat in the streets of Los Angeles, drug out of a truck. I hate to see that. I hate to see that little Samantha Runyon taken out, grabbed in the front yard. You know what that little precious thing said? She's out there playing with a friend, with a friend in the front yard, in the backyard. And that guy come up there and snatched her. And that precious little thing, while she was being hauled away, she said to her friend, a little tooth missing in the front. 
she said to her little friend, tell granny, tell granny, tell my granny. That was the last word she said. Tell my granny. And they find that little thing dead and fixed in such a way out there in that desert that the cops threw up. I hate that. But I got news for you. Jesus, Solomon said, I looked and I saw and behold, the power was on the side of the oppressor. But I got good news for you. Jesus has come. I said, Jesus has come. <laughs> Hallelujah. When people get in trouble, they don't call on Buddha. When people get in trouble, they don't call on Muhammad. When people get in trouble, they don't want to run no Muslim temple. They call on Jesus. When those miners were up there buried under the earth in Pennsylvania, the governor said, when they asked him, when they told him that they heard that all the miners were fine, they said, what was the response of the families? And he said, all I could hear was praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's what the governor said. They wanted to thank you, Buddha, in the house. It was thank you, Jesus. You know, whoa. Do you know why? Jesus Christ has all power. It's been, stand to your feet, glory to God. Oh, lift your voices and praise him. Whoa. Man, praise him. Hallelujah. Glory. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, why do I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You need it for these five benefits. Number one, he'll give you constant evidence because the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. He'll give you constant evidence that you're accepted by God. Number two, he'll stabilize you and make you strong and bold in the Lord. He'll take the wishy-washiness out of you. He'll take the, the up and down, in and out, shamefacedness off of you, where you fall and falter so many times, he'll take it off of you. Number three, he'll give you a satisfying portion. He'll satisfy your soul. He'll satisfy you. Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and I will give him waters that'll satisfy him. Number four, he'll cause you to have joy. He'll turn your mourning into dancing. Number five, he'll give you great power and he'll give you authority. I want to ask tonight, every person under the sound of my voice that wants to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, you don't have it and you want it, and you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost, I don't want you, first of all, to feel inferior to other Christians because you're not. Let me tell you what. Many times people don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they're never given an opportunity. So it's not your fault. Number two, a lot of times people don't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they haven't heard it preached and have not been in a service like this where a pastor actually calls people forward to be prayed for and have hands laid on them to receive the baptism. So you're not inferior. And it doesn't mean that these other people are better than you are or more spiritual than you are or more accepted by God than you are. It doesn't mean any of those things. But if you're here tonight and you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in unknown tongues, your prayer language, as the Spirit of God gives utterance, I want you, number one, to realize several things. You must be born again to be a candidate to receive the baptism. You must be saved. You must be born again. That's, that's the candidate. That's the qualifications to become filled with the Holy Spirit. You must be saved, washed in the blood, your sins under the blood. Now, you might be saying here tonight, Brother Kilpatrick, if I smoke or if I dip or if I chew or if I cuss and I hate those ha bad habits, you think the Lord would fill me with the Holy Spirit. There was a time I didn't believe he would because I thought that you had to get rid of those things before he would fill you with the Holy Spirit. But I don't believe that anymore, and I'll tell you the reason why I don't believe it. Because I've seen the Lord give the baptism of the Holy Spirit to people like that to help them overcome that very thing. 
It blew my mind. It blew my mind as a young preacher just getting started in the ministry to see a couple in my church. Both of them smoked, and they both got baptized in the Holy Ghost and had cigarettes all over their breath when I was praying for them. And I said, Lord, you can't do this. <laughs> but you know what? Filled them with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, gave them power to overcome that damnable habit. And they laid them down and never touched them again. You know who I'm talking about, the one of Robbins. And, you know, dipping and chewing, those are nasty habits, friend. Glory to God. Both my grannies used to dip snuff. And I used to go visit them. And I'd go to Mama's mama's house first. She'd say, come here, Alden. And she'd grab me and kiss me and leave snuff on his cheek. And then I'd go over to visit my daddy's mama. And she's a big old woman. And I'd walk in, she'd say, come here, Alden. And she'd kiss me on this cheek, and the snuff would drip down on this cheek. And so I said, glory to God, I may do a lot of things in my life, but I'll never dip and chew, hallelujah. I got my bait of that when I was a young'un. Both my grannies dipped. Both my grannies dipped snuff. And I don't dip snuff, hallelujah. But if you dip snuff, or if you chew tobacco, or if you smoke, or if you're bound by pornography, or whatever, and you hate it, and you want to hang on to the Lord, and you want to trust the Lord, and you want to get that under the blood, but you need power in your life, man, you need to come tonight and let God baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you something else. I want you to get your mind off of the tongues. It's like some people get so anxious, they're waiting until their tongue. Listen, just forget that. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something you have to strive for or something you have to convince God to give you. It's a gift. It's not something that you have to fight for or you have to qualify for to be so good and, oh, Lord, I think I'm now almost good enough to receive it. No, it's a gift, and that gift gives you power. So if you're here tonight, and I feel like there's a lot of you, and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit while the worship team sings, we're going to pray for you. But before we do that, I want the ministers, full-time pastors that's with me tonight in this audience, and pastors' wives, you're in the full-time ministry. I want you to come forward first. I want the prayer team to come forward also here at Brownsville. And I want you just to sort of line up through here and get ready because there's going to be a lot of people come forward in just a moment. So if you will, come quickly first. And I'll call for the rest of you in just a moment, those of you that want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Come on. Come on right now. Just fill these aisles. And we're going to move through here and begin to pray for you. Go ahead. Come on. Take some time with you. Come on. 